Ladies and gentlemen, George says it's time. <laughs> and what George says goes. So before we get too far, um, I want to tell you a little bit about me and why this subject is interesting to me. Uh, my wife and I moved back to Western Washington. We were raised in Western Washington, but we moved back to Western Washington about three years ago. And prior to that, I'd been a professor uh, at Utah State University in their <coughs> landscape architecture department. And prior to that, I was a professor at Washington State University. And prior to that, I was the campus planner and campus landscape architect for the University of Idaho. So when you're dealing with students and campuses and buildings, your head tends to be out. You know, how big is that tree going to get? How big is this class going to get? How big? Is this building going to get? So you're always kind of oriented out to the future. For most of that time, I was also a member and in leadership of a very conservative fundamentalist evangelical church. Please don't pull that against me. <laughs> um, I've only been a Lutheran for a few years, which means I come to all this with a completely different perspective than those of you who are lifelong Lutherans. Um, again, I apologize in advance for that. <laughs> that they were lifelong? Or... <laughs> David, take that any way you want. <laughs> uh, my purpose here today is to lay out for you some of what's happening in the church and why. And we're going to talk a lot about North American Protestant Christianity. Um, I, I could say North American evangelical Christianity, and I would lump Lutherans in with that as well. In fact, it's in your name. Yeah. Yeah. Some of us have problems with that. That's, that's fair. That's fair. <clears throat> so there's a shift happening culturally and in the church where the tectonic plates of culture are shifting and uh, in, in ways that will completely reshape the future of the church and culture. And that shift will not be complete in our lifetimes. I'm sorry, bums me out. <laughs> it will be complete perhaps in your children's lifetime. And I guarantee you it'll be complete in your grandchildren's lifetime. And here we are at the cusp of this. So. Some of what um, I used to do for the pastoral staff, and go ahead, George, you can change the slides. What I did for the pastoral staff at the, at the church we came from, uh, and I was on the, I was uh, not an ordained minister, I was a licensed minister in that church. But uh, out of interest and training, again, I, like I said, my head was always kind of out forward of where we were right now. My wife still says my head is not here. Um, I was studying and reading about the future of the church um, and specifically about the future of North American Protestant evangelicalism. And to be frank, everything I read frightened me. The church, and by that mean, I mean, uh, by that I mean North American Protestantism of all stripes, whether you're Baptist, Southern Baptist, Lutheran, non-denominational, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Pentecostal, Charismatic, doesn't matter what you are, all of those are in trouble by all traditional measures. No matter how you want to slice and dice it, whether it's volunteerism, uh, numbers, butts in the pew, however you want to measure it, whether it's a mini church or a mega church, they're all in trouble. Even the ones who, who tell you that they're not in trouble. The Mormons will put up all kinds of statistics of how their church is growing. But what they don't tell you, there for every one coming in the front door, there's two going out the back door. Catholicism is kind of holding its ground in North America on the basis of immigrants. Catherine Witcher, in her book, The Fall of the Evangelical Nation, makes the claim that no church in America, no church in America, can convert an adult over the age of 25. 
Now I read that and I scoffed. I said, that cannot possibly be true. So I got with a couple of my friends from my old church. I said, tell me who we've converted in the last eight years. Now we were a young, we were a church that had a lot of college students. So we converted a lot of college students. But I said specifically, adult males over the age of 25, how many have we converted? I mean, raw conversion. And we went, through, we had a phone list, just like you have a phone list. Almost 700 members. And we went through it and we could not find a single name of a person over the age of 25 who was converted by the activities of our church. So how do you define converted? Uh, that's an excellent question, and we probably don't have time to discuss it <laughs> here. We've discussed it at Theology on Tap. What does it mean to be saved? And I know that Lutherans have a different definition of that than other churches. But basically, has a new person come to your church that did not come from another church? Somebody who wasn't already a Christian. And when we went through that phone list, we could not come up with a single name. And being on the ministerial staff, we had a, a big conversation one day. And I said, you know, we talk about, you know, being in love with our community and wanting to reach our community for Jesus, blah, 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 blah. And I said, we are failing miserably at that. And of course, all the other pastors took great umbrage that I said we were failing. And I said, we're just like Walmart. When Walmart comes into a new town, they cannibalize shoppers from other stores. They don't make new shoppers, they cannibalize other shoppers. And I said, we're cannibalizing from other churches, which really offended a couple of the pastors. But it's true, every name we went through was a person from another church. And finally the pastor, the senior pastor said, no, 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 what about X? And we all realized, oh yes, X, he was a new convert, one in eight years out of a church of five, six, seven hundred people. So, Catherine Witcher was right. <coughs> now, in September of 2019, a report was issued by the ELCA's Office of Research and Evaluation. Uh, are, do you know of this report, September 19? Uh, I maybe have heard of it, but I'm not, it's not coming to mind. I think the findings were lost in the hubbub surrounding COVID because COVID broke just, you know, yeah, right. two months later. Yeah. Here's what they projected. This is from ELCA's own Office of Research and Evaluation. They said that the whole denomination will have fewer than 16,000 or fewer than 67,000 members in 2050. Fewer than 67,000 members. And by 2041, just 20 years away, there'll be fewer than 16,000 in worship on an average Sunday. That's right. According to the current trends, our church, this church, the ELCA, will basically cease to exist within the next generation. Now, that's pretty hard news to take. And frankly, it's very tempting to put our heads in the sand and, and say like Frodo, um, I wish it need not have happened in my time. But Gandalf's advice to Frodo and his advice to us is, and so do I, and so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that's given us. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. <clears throat> What's going on with the church and what can we do here and now? We're going to talk about a lot about data and signs and things that are happening. And sometimes the image we see comes out of the data. And sometimes you don't even see the data. You just see the image. So how many of you see the cube? How many of you didn't see the cube until I mentioned it? Okay, so what you focus on determines what you see, and importantly, what you focus on determines what you miss. 
We need to see what's going on around us. So we know what's happening. Now, please don't um, hear that what I'm saying is that, that Jesus Christ's church is in trouble. Uh, he said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But, um, and that, that's absolutely true. But specifically, all brands of Protestantism and honestly Catholicism in North America as, as a religious entity are struggling. So my research led me to this book, The Great Emergence by Phyllis Tickle. The subtitle is uh, How Christianity is Changing and Why. Tickle, who died in 2015, um, was the uh, internationally renowned expert on uh, religion and founder of the religion department in Publishers Weekly. She's written over 40 books. And in this particular one, she describes how Christianity fits into the large sweeping uh, scheme of history. It's a quick, quick, relatively quick read, um, less than 200 pages. I found it very interesting, very stimulating, and also very scary. So what I want to do today is take a look at her major premise, extend it, stretch it, um, perhaps add some insights to it, and then see what we can learn about living for us, living in such a time as this. Uh, we're going to look at 6,000 years of history in a ill-focused oversight. <laughs> so please bear with me. Okay. Tickle quotes Anglican Bishop Mark Dyer when he said that every 500 years, um, the only way to understand what's currently happening in the church is that for every 500 years, the church feels compelled to hold a giant image sale. And we are living in one of those rummage sales. A rummage sale is the idea that about every 500 years, about around every 500 years, both institutional Christianity and the wider culture and society go through an upheaval that challenges old assumptions, traditions, and ideas and methodologies. Because whether we like it or not, religion is intimately tied to the culture in which it exists. Faith cannot exist independent of its cultural surround. Uh, remember, what did they call Jesus? Jesus of Nazareth. There was a place a geographic place he was from. He was embedded in his culture. So when cultures change, the church must change. And this happens because over the course of several hundred years, the, uh, the empowered structures of institutional Christianity, the religiousness of Christianity, become a rigid and bony structure, um, what uh, Tickle calls an intolerable carapace, like a tortoise shell. A hard shell that must be shattered if the truth of the gospel is to be made known. And this isn't necessarily a planned uh, or organized rummage sale. It just happens. Almost like a natural cycle. And during a rummage sale, all of these ideas and traditions and ways of doing life and ways of being Christian and ways of doing church are pulled out and re-examined and re-evaluated and some are kept and some are jettisoned jettisoned, some are reconceptualized, or just sold off in the moment. So. so we have, whether we like it or not, entered a change of era. We are no longer in Christendom. We are in post-Christendom. We've entered an era of post-Christianity. 200 years ago, even 100 years ago, everyone in North America lived within the context of a biblical worldview. Even if they weren't Christians, even if they didn't read the Bible, they knew what the Bible was. They knew what the Ten Commandments were. They knew all of that. But there are kids today. Remember, I taught for 20 years, freshmen through grad students. Kids who don't have a flipping clue what's in the Bible. Or that it exists. Or that it exists. We had one young, young woman. It's like going into a record store and somebody saying, hey, did you know that Paul McCartney was in a band before Wings? Because <laughs> <laughs> this, this young freshman college student got, you know, got plugged into our church, started reading the Bible, and she just exploded. She said, did you know that Noah is in the Bible? 
That whole ark and the flood thing? That's in the Bible. We're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know? But she did not come from Christendom. She had no clue. She was surprised and shocked. Now, the bad news is that most of the culture doesn't share our views, our priorities, our values, or our thinking. The good news is that most of the culture does not share our priorities, our values, or our thinking. It's almost as though we have a fresh new world to evangelize it. So let me give you just a couple of caveats, however, as we talk about these things. So um, these changes, that happen in this semi, uh, semi-millennial cycle of cultural change. These changes are not as obvious as something occurring exactly every 500 years on the mark, but really more like around every 500 years, give or take 50 to 75 years on either side of the, the 500 year mark. It takes time to turn a big ship. Think about a tanker and how, how many miles it takes to turn a tanker. Well, the church with all of its uh, enmeshment with culture and society and government and demographics and everything takes just as long to, to turn and change. Um, but we tend to, to look at scientific, or uh, not scientific, but we tend to look at specific dates and say, ah, here, this is when it happened. But I guarantee you it was coming up before that and it kept going after that. So it's around every 500 years. Secondly, to identify and articulate something that appears to be happening every 500 years is not to say that the culture, the culture and the church lie quiescent and napping in the intervening 500 years. No, no, no. Something's always happened. And for everything I say this morning that happened at the turn of one of these cycles, you'll be able to think of a dozen other things that also happened and that could be considered as important as what happened at the 500 year mark. So just bear with me. With those caveats in mind, here's how the pattern generally works. In almost every one of these cyclical changes, especially in the church, the same pattern occurs. We spend about a hundred years, let's go to the next slide, George. We spend about a hundred years arguing about authority. Some of that before the change, some of that after the change. About a hundred years arguing about authority. And then we spend about 250 years living with the change even if we don't agree with it or like it. And then about 150 years leading up to the next change, there's a chipping away at authority until we reach a crisis and we start the cycle over. So just as a quick example, if we look closely at the Great Reformation, um, we pin it on a date. We say October 31st, 1517. That's when it happened. But I guarantee you it was building up before that, right? With Wycliffe and Tyndale and everybody else. Um, the argument reached a peak. If we go back 100 years from 1517 to 1417 or the late 1300s, there were three popes running around Southern Europe arguing about who has the authority. And a, a simple peasant in Europe in 1394 knew there was a problem when there's three popes arguing over authority. Not just one, three. So Luther started the Reformation and the authority shifted from the popes to the Bible and to the individual. And for 250 years, we see the growth of the church and its growth was significantly in the realm of Protestant evangelicalism. The folks who emphasized the primacy of the scriptures and then starting about 100 years ago with the rise of modernism, um, the conservative evangelicals started to push back focusing on the fundamentals of the faith. And that's where the term fundamentalist comes from. That's only about hundred years old. And they begin to argue about where's the authority? Is it in scripture or community or somewhere else? So let's take a look at these, these cycles of change. So go ahead, George. The first, really the birth of, uh, we're gonna go from, from left to right, zero, AD, around AD 33, um, the birth of the church. Now, the church was initially just a new way of being Jewish and was considered a deviant offshoot of uh, Judaism. 
But historians call this moment in history the great transformation. The question of authority was articulated between Jesus and the religious authorities of the day. Remember, because Jesus always said things like, well, you've heard it said, but I said. He was throwing himself up against the existing authority. So where's the authority is the question. Then about 500 years in, at the first semi-millennial point, we have the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. Now, what else is happening in the world 451 AD? Rome is crumbling. This first council was to settle what the nature of Christ is or was. And the result of the council was that the church forked into three branches, Eastern Orthodox Church, the Western Latin Church, and the Oriental Orthodox Church. So for the first 500 years, the church had been one. And now suddenly, it's three. And then another 500 years in, around 1000 AD, in the semi-millennial semi cycle, we have July 6, 1054. A friend told me it was a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> the day of the great schism when Pope Leo IX excommunicated the patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church and the patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church excommunicated Pope Leo and the two churches did not speak 500 years, no, for a thousand years. It wasn't until 1995 that the churches, they, they actually had a, a rapprochement. So the church of Christ that for a thousand years had been united, albeit forked, now splits into completely two divisions, Eastern Orthodox and the Western Latin or Roman Catholic Church. Then, 500 years later, what do we have? 1517, Martin Luther uh, attacks his 95 theses about the indulgences to the Wittenberg Castle Church door, and the rest, as they say, is history. Luther did not intend to start a Protestant Reformation, but he did. And the question really was, again, of authority. Is it the Pope, the Curia, and the Magisterium, or is it the Bible and individual conscience? What did he say at the Diet of Worms? I stand where I am and I cannot change. I'm the individual here. I don't care what the Pope and the Diet and everybody else says. I can do no more. I cannot change. Putting himself as an individual up against all of that. Yes? Don't run. Yeah, good point. Okay. <laughs> Connecting dots. Yeah. So now, 500 years later, here we have 2022. We're just 505 years later wondering what is the landmark event in cultural history or in church history that will become the name of Christianity in the next 500 years. We are, as Tickle says, on the cusp of the great emergence, waiting to see what will emerge on the other side of this transition cycle. The question of authority is, is simple. What is the Bible and how much authority do we give it in our lives? Is authority invested in the Bible or are in our interpretations of it? And if that's the case, who gets to interpret? So we have to understand that these periods of change every 500 years are hugely significant in the history of the culture and church. And these kinds of changes really can't be seen in advance. We know kind of what's happening and what's going on. We see a pattern, but we really don't know what the end result will be. These things are best understood and appreciated in retrospect. But we do know from looking back at other changes that there are three significant outcomes as a result of this upheaval in the life of the church. First, a new and more vital form of Christianity emerges. No one prior to 1517 would have predicted the great Protestant Reformation. It was so radical and completely unimaginable a change that it simply couldn't have been predicted or expected. Nobody was writing in blogs in 1490 predicting a completely different form of Christianity would merge at the beginning of the 16th century. And that Christendom was ready for, but, but that Christendom was ready for a change is evidence in how rapidly the Reformation took hold and caught flame and how hot and how far it burned. Second, 
the previous expression of the church doesn't go away. It actually becomes pure. The status quo of organized expression of Christianity, which up until that time had been the dominant one, is, re is reconstituted into a more pure and less ossified version of its previous self. So what was the, the, the Catholic Church's uh, reaction to the Reformation? The Counter-Reformation, counter exactly. It changed the church. Not always for the good, because I'm thinking about the Inquisition, but it changed. The third result is of equal, if not greater significance. And that is that every time the incrustations of an overly established Christianity have been broken open, the faith has spread and been spread dramatically into new geographic and demographic areas, uh, thereby increasing exp uh, exponentially the range and depth of Christianity's reach as a result of its time of unease and distress. For example, again, before the birth of Protestantism, not only established, it not only established a new and powerful way of being Christian, but it also forced the Roman Catholics to make changes in their own structure. As a result of both of these changes, Christianity was spread over far more of the Earth's territories than it's ever been in the past. And again, um, that's not all good news because the, the doctrine of discovery. doctrine of discovery, thank you for saying that. It's hard to tell with your face. <laughs> uh, the doctrine of discovery spread the gospel all over the earth, but not always with good results. Yes. It also seems like the second one is not necessarily a good thing either, because becoming pure may be becoming more hardened. Yes. May be becoming more, as much as more fundamental. Yes. Or really returning to a position which right. was even yeah, and I think when Tickle talks about this, she's really looking at it with rose-colored glasses, that, that Catholicism got better. In some ways, maybe. I like Baroque architecture. Uh, but, I mean, that, and that was a result of counter-reformation. So, yeah, yeah, good point, good point. Now, in a footnote in Tickle's book, she makes a, a uh, uh, comment in passing that this cycle may actually be re related to a longer cycle of a Judeo-Christian nature and when we push back from the birth of Christ. So if we go to this next slide and we started at a zero on the right and we're going toward the left, 500 years earlier was the return from Babylonian captivity and the rebuilding of the temple in Daniel. Something big happened and changed in the life of, of, of the of Judaism faith. 500 years before that was the monarchy. It started with Saul, but then David and Solomon. And that was kind of the high point of, 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 of the history of Israel. 500 years before that was around the time of the Exodus, depending on how you date it where Moses and the people of Israel left Egypt. That was huge. 500 years before that was probably around the call of Abraham. Now, again, it depends on, you know, if you look in your Bible and you're reading and they give you dates at the, at the start of the chapters. A lot of that's made up. They don't know. But generally, this is the history of, of Judaism. And if we go 500 years back from that, it's roughly around the time of uh, no way I and I didn't take any further back because it's just too crazy. <laughs> so, so while Tickle identified these three characteristics, um, I was inclined to take a step back and, and look not just at these three or four uh, semi-millennial cycles between 33 AD and 2000, but also those that preceded it, and um, and ask myself what what is going on, what's God up to, and how. And how are humans, how are we as humans supposed to navigate these kinds of momentous changes? How are we to live at the micro level here today, this morning, this afternoon, this week, when the, the uh, in light of the turmoil and the foment of the perfect storm surrounds us? What can we expect to see in these hinge periods, in this semi-millennial cycle that we're in right now? Um, I believe that there are four characteristics common to every one of these semi-millennial cycles. Three are natural, 
And one is spiritual, and the spiritual one I broke into three parts. Is there a clock over Okay, so I have about half that. Yeah, that's all right. I can't wear my watch because I, I hurt my wrist. And that's why. Five minutes. Um, the characteristics I'm going to identify do not occur solely at these 500 year marks. Some of these things are happening all the time. But once every 500 years, the same things happen again. And over the top of all this layer, this the spiritual thing that God appears to be doing as well. So the first big change uh, is the political climate changes. So 2500 BC, all of civilization was destroyed. 2000 BC, when Abraham, or with Abraham, the Sumerian and the Akkadian civilizations were in decline and the old Babylonian civilization was on the rise, just as Abraham was called to leave Ur and head west. 1500 BC, why did the children of Israel say, let's go back? Because the entire economy and environment and ecology of, Egyptian, of Egypt was destroyed. Why did they want to go back? But it happened. Um, 1000 BC, with David, the, the, you see the kingdom of Israel was in ascendancy and all the neighboring kingdoms were in decline. 500 BC, in Daniel's life, we see the fall of Israel, Judea, and the Jews taken captivity uh, to Babylon, but within his own life, they were returned to Jerusalem. And then, of course, zero, lots of things happened, right? And then 500 AD, uh, the Roman Empire was collapsing. Rome had been uh, sacked in 410. And at the same year as the Council of Chalcedon, Attila the Hun was defeated at the Battle of Shalom's. Uh, and about four years later, Rome would be sacked again. So political turmoil. 1000 AD, uh, the Holy Roman Empire is just a few decades old. And all across Europe, nations are being born out of cities. City states became nation states. At 1500, the Renaissance is in full swing. All the nations of Europe are in competition economically, politically, militarily, and that competition is played out on the high seas and in the new world. And in 2000, we see the face of politics in America and maybe the world has been undeniably changed at the election of first, our first African-American president and then at the election of, of uh, President Trump. And then we think about international power and politics. Is China on the rise? Or is Russia the one we have to fear? What is going on? Everybody's like freaking out at the change of the climate, uh, of political climate. Next. The exact same thing happens uh, roughly with the climate, climate of the climate changes. And in every one of these 500 year marks, there's some major climate thing going on either right on the mark or spanning the mark. So just um, 500 BC, there's an unnamed cold period in the records that was occurring around the founding of Rome. And it's actually reflected in the Bible in Ezra chapter 10, when they read the law, but they stood in the cold rain for a day, rain for an entire day. And then um, around zero, the Ro war Roman warm period, brackets the 500 year mark there, and allowed Rome to spread crazy across Europe. Suddenly, they go over the Alps, and the climate is so much warmer that they're actually growing grapes and olives in France. And then it got so warm, they're growing grapes in England. And in the 1300s, England, uh, Rome, or uh, France passed laws banning the import of English wine. And, and you know what they're doing now? They're growing wine again in England. Around 1000 AD is the great medieval warming that lasted from 900 to 1300, spanned this millennial mark. Um, little attention is paid to this time, but it was a period of warming and climate and mild weather uh, all over the world. Arctic uh, ice retreat is so far north uh, that it's uh, likely that this period of agricultural prosperity fueled wealth across Europe and may have been instrumental in spurring the Renaissance. But then it was followed in 1500 with the Little Ice Age. 
that lasted from about 1350 to 1850, spanning that again that 1500 year cycle. This period was characterized by unpredictable extreme wet and cold weather. Glaciers advanced uh, for the first time in centuries and destroyed irrigation channels in the high mountains and valleys and uh, overran forests. Crops failed all across Europe. Livestock used for farming had to be eaten and that impacted the next uh, season's ability to grow food and the, spike, uh, the cycle spiraled downward, resulting in famines and deaths all across Europe, coupled with Black Death, because everybody's huddled inside trying to stay warm, they're all together and they're all breathing each other's air and they're all catching diseases. And here we are in 2000 AD, uh, another uh, global warming period. Uh, it was gonna warm anyway, but what humans did was step on the gas both literally, figuratively, and literally. <laughs> okay, next. The health climate changes. Every one of these periods is also marked by pandemic diseases. And I remember when I first read this, I thought, well, we, we, we have medicine. We don't have any pandemic diseases. <laughs> and then, <laughs> so the Justinian plague was around 500 AD. And uh, some historians have suggested that a total European population loss of between 50 and 60% between 541 and 700. We didn't have it that bad. Um, AD 1000, bubonic plague. AD 1500 was the first influenza pandemic. In 1510, the first international flu pandemic spread from Africa, swept through Northern Europe, with an estimated mortality rate of 20%. So here we are in this era of foment and change and the titanic shifting of these tectonic plates. And, and you and I are born right into it. Most of us in this room came to uh, age in this transition zone. And in 20 or 40 years, maybe longer, We'll be looking back at this transition zone, uh, if I'm even thinking in 20 years. <laughs> I don't know about you, I don't have great hope for that, but anyway. Um, so here now, in the midst of this transition, we're simply calling it postmodernism, but only because it came after modernity. Um, but it's a, a, a new nascent form of Christianity is emerging. Uh, Brian McLaren, in his book, uh, the Church on the Other Side. This is probably one of the best books I've read about this topic. And he said, by 2030, maybe 2050, we'll know what is what Christianity will be characterized on the other side of this transition. Um, he's written a ton of books. In my mind, that's one of his, his best. Um, but if you think about this, let's look at the next slide. Um, some of you may have experienced these movements Things started to really uh, rumble in, in the 40 years prior to the millennial change. You had the Jesus people, charismatic uh, movement. Anybody here? Yeah, you go, sister. Um, the emerging church movement in the 80s through about the 90s. I don't know if any of you read the, there's a really cute obituary for the emerging church that was published in, in uh, 2010, I think. I talked about who its parents were and that, it, that uh, parents outlived the child, the emerging church. Anyway, um, then in the late uh, 90s through you know 2020 or so, we're talking about the missional church, also known as the authentic church. There was also a small church movement in here. And then uh, what Gabe Lyons calls the next Christians. The, the good news about the end of Christian America really fun little book. So all of this stuff is happening. So all of those changes were natural changes. Now let's take a look at some of the spiritual changes. Um, God is always doing something, not just on these 500 year cycles, but he's always doing something. So uh, part of what happens though, in this particular change every 500 years, it seems that God is especially interested in reinforcing his desire for relationship with people. And God chooses people for relationship in order to bring blessing on the rest of the world. So God chose Noah. 
God chose Abraham. Remember each of these five hundred disciples. God chose Abraham and promised to bring blessing to the rest of the earth. Um, 1500 BC, God chooses Moses. 1000 BC, God chooses David to be king. 500 BC, God works through Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah to rebuild the temple, restore worship. Um, in zero, duh, God sends one man that blesses all mankind. In 500, uh, in 500, the church in the east, west, and south acknowledge that cultural, significant cultural differences influence how the gospel is played out across the world. And this period saw the rise of monasticism and the pursuit of God by individuals and then individuals who gathered in like-minded assemblies of, of believers and communities. So the whole monastic thing started around that time. 500 or 1500, uh, God speaks to Martin Luther in change. And now in 2000, the next cycle, God wants to move in my life, in your life, in relationship to bless you. And in that process of relationship blessing, he wants to use you to extend that blessing to others around you. So here's, I mean, it gets really interesting here when you think about the number of topics that have suddenly become okay to talk about. Um, pushback against penal substitutionary atonement, pushback against hell, pushback against bibliolatry. All these things are happening now in relationship where uh, people who are seeking God and trying to find a way forward. There's also been a rise in the recognition of feminist theology, LGBTQ theology, anti-colonial theology, and environmental creation care uh, theology, all of which bring freedom and blessing to other people. Second, in the second, um, our identity and relationship. Who are we in the midst of this relationship with God? And uh, he's after us understanding our identity. There seems to be as well an emphasis on communal relationship with him as a community of people of faith. So we've, we've spent the last 250 years with the rise of radical individualism. And now we're seeing the rise of community thought and communal salvation. And the same thing happened in each of these 500 year cycles. So what's happening now is a swing back towards, uh, away from radical individualism and uh, away, uh, a rise, where am I in my notes? Now is a swing back towards our identity, not just as saved individuals, but also our identity and responsibility as members of a saved community and what the responsibilities of that saved community are to our identity as we are also members of an unsaved community. What do we owe our neighbors? Can you talk a little bit about saved and unsaved? <laughs> Again, remember I told you I'm a new Lutheran. <laughs> I would categorize myself as Lutheran-ish. <laughs> My evangelical roots run deep. I was raised conservative American Baptist, and then through the Jesus People Movement, got involved with the Charismatic Church, uh, which was also fundamental conservative and evangelical. In that world, save means I gave my life with a special magic prayer to Jesus, and he came into my heart. And I became saved. How many of you as Lutherans prayed a salvation prayer at the altar when you were a little kid? <laughs> One hand. One hand. We had this conversation at Theology on Tap. Because you were Methodist, you didn't ever pray that prayer. I did. Oh, you did? Yeah. Why you raise your hand? Well, you said as Lutheran. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but we, we had this is a really interesting conversation we had a theology on tap a few months ago about what does it mean to be saved? What and and Carol Dana, bless her heart, she's not here. She no, said, she's oh, oh, is she online? Yeah. Hi, Carol. <laughs> Carol goes, What do you mean by saved? What are you talking about? And it was it was a really because I was, it was the first time I realized. These people don't speak the same language as me. But again, remember, I came from a conservative. Well, I, 
I, that, that's part of my growing up uh, theology too that I had to recover. <laughs> I just I, I wonder in this whole context of what you're talking about in terms of the of the evolutionary context of the church and it's uh, what saved means in that context. Right. So, you know, I would be I would say members of a faith community maybe mm -hmm. as opposed to a saved community. Sure. And that's fair. That's a that's a that's a fine way. To say it. But sometimes we think that the only community we belong to is here inside these four walls, and we belong to a larger community as well, and we have obligations to that community as well. Um, next slide. Relating to God with each other in this community in new ways will result in new worship. And at every one of these 500 year cycles, I don't have time to go through them all, um, something new and different happens in worship. I will say this, please forgive me things. <laughs> <laughs> a few years ago, uh, this was before we moved back, I, we were in a church in, in you know, a little Lutheran church in uh, Northern Utah. And we were singing the songs and I'm, Reading the bottom of the hymnal page. 1638. <laughs> the newest, the newest song we sang was almost 100 years old. Most of them were three, four, 500 years old. And I remember thinking at the time, what is it with Lutherans always looking back, you know, driving in the rear view mirror? Y'all realize, of course, that there's been a lot of changes in worship. And, and for all the badness that Hillsong is in the news now with, they got some wonderful rock and roll worship. And, and, and it's not all good, I understand that. Uh, but, but remember, for 35 years of my adult life, we had a rock and roll praise band. It was a band, you guys. It wasn't a pipe, I'm sorry, it was not a pipe organ. We had a bass, we had a lead guitar, we had acoustic guitar, we had a saxophone. I mean, we, it, we rocked. <laughs> so the first time I came to a Lutheran church, it was like, wow, I got to give up my rock and roll ways. <laughs> it, was, it was frightening. So um, we're going to fly now. Okay, next slide. In the 60s, so, and this is all to get to where are we at right now? In the 60s, virtually every church in America could be categorized in one of these four uh, quadrants. Liturgical included Anglican, Episcopalian, uh, Catholic, some high, uh, high Lutherans. What's it? High, high church. church. High church. High, high church, yeah. Social justice included basically the mainline Protestant denominations, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Methodist, um, <laughs> some Lutherans. The renewalist corner included uh, charismatics and Pentecostals, and the conservatives, which were mostly evangelicals, um, fundamentalists, Baptists, evangelical free church, Bible believing church. Um, there's a lot of overlap, but remember these are broad brush strokes. And then something started to happen in the 60s and 70s. Um, there's some uh, what um, Diana Butler Bass calls the fourth great awakening, and that was the charismatic renewal. It's that knew no denominational lines. There were charismatic Catholics, charismatic Episcopalians, charismatic Methodists, yes, charismatic <laughs> Methodists, charismatic Lutherans, charismatic Baptists. There were people uh, singing and swaying and lifting their hands and praying in tongues in every denomination. And then in the 80s and 90s, that kind of got shut down by the conservative movement. But it's starting to bubble back up. Not the same way, but it's starting to bubble back up. So what started to happen in the 90s and the 2000s was that these lines, go ahead, next slide. These lines, I'm going to go back forward. No, go forward. <laughs> <laughs> these lines started to break down. And, and liturgicals, started to borrow things from the social justice churches. And the social justice churches started to actually read their Bibles, <laughs> like the conservatives. 
And the conservatives started to use the worship of the charismatics, charismaniacs, and the Pentecostals. And the Pentecostals would do things like, let's light a candle during worship. <laughs> and and what, what is Lent anyway? And they started to borrow traditions from other churches. And, and that, that's, that happened a lot, still happening. I cannot tell you how angry I was when I discovered the liturgical calendar and liturgical hours and liturgical prayer. And I was, I was angry that for all of my life, these conservative fundamentalists kept me from this thing that all the other churches have enjoyed for 2,000 years. And I was so pissed off. <laughs> and I was angry. Why did they hide this? Why did they lie to me? I want to pray the hours. And I had to get my own prayer book and do it myself. Because no church I was attending wanted to do it. So we ended up losing. <laughs> <You're> welcome. <laughs> so, in fact, um, a lot of these groups started to, next slide, started to swirl in the center, changing and shifting, and, and people who had grown up Baptists were suddenly becoming Lutherans, and Pentecostals were suddenly becoming, you know, social justice people, and, and, and Tickle speculated that this swirling center will grow and pull all Christians into it or the majority of Christians in North America into this swirling center. She predicted by 2025, remember she wrote this book in 2005. It was published in 2008, but you know, she was working on it back then. I think she was overly optimistic about how soon we would all swirl in the center. But I think certainly by mid-century, we'll see the swirling. And we'll have to come to grips with the fact that not all our Lutheran traditions are going to be adopted by everyone else. So, I've lost a page in my notes. Oh, yes. We need to remember Tickle's three points about these changes, right? First, a new and more vital form of Christianity does indeed emerge. Second, previous, previous expressions don't go away, they become purer. And third, the gospel spread uh, dramatically into new geographic and demographic areas, thereby increasing its range and depth of Christianity's reach. So that's what's happening now and over the course of the next 10 to 20 years. And what, what's going to happen, next slide, is that as this world grows, some people are going to say, maybe you will say this, you know what? I'm not up for this kind of change. At this stage of life, I just want to go do my Lutheran thing. And you retreat into the corner, going back up into liturgical or, or social justice. Some people, maybe you, maybe people you know and love, will say, let's change and jump into this world. So is, is she talking about, in her book, is this limited to uh, North America, or is this Worldwide. It's primarily for focus because the rest of the world is trailing behind whatever happens in Northern Europe and in North America. We're now experiencing North America what happened in Europe, Europe right. 30, 40 years ago. And South America, uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, the church is growing mostly in the Pentecostal charismatic range and Catholic, but they're going to experience the same thing we are in about 20 years. Um, so, you or someone you, you know and love, maybe yourself, will be drawn to the center. Others you know and love, maybe yourself, will say, I'm not ready for that kind of change. I'm going to rest quietly in the traditions I know and that I'm comfortable with. But here we are. This is us. This is now. This is the, we were born for such a time as this. And we simply have to decide, what are we going to do about it? Now, next slide. Some suggestions. Keep an open mind and spirit. Please know there's really nothing you can do to prevent these changes. <laughs> They're going to happen. Secondly, avoid criticizing those moving in a different direction than you. Because you know what? Ten years ago, I was criticizing Lutherans. 
Five years ago, I became a woofer. Avoid criticizing those moving in a different direction than you. Be patient with those who are trying to decide what's going on. Um, this might have really helped you this morning. It may all suddenly snap into focus and clarity, and, and you, you're going to be able to make decisions and understand what's going on. But there will be plenty around you who are still trying to understand what is going on. That's okay. Be patient. Some of them may never get it. You guys, I have Pentecostal friends that I've known for over 50 years. And they're still doing that Pentecostal thing without any thought about what else is happening in the world. Third or fourth, uh, be led by the Spirit. Because uh, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. So, uh, in the last few minutes here, just we're going to wrap this up really quick. How is this world being played out at the denominational and congregational level? It's happening in a process called unloading the doctrinal core. So, most denominations, let's go to the next one too. Most denominations, most individuals, um, view Christianity this way. There is a core of doctrines that form the heart of what we believe, and this area holds what we believe are the necessary behaviors and beliefs for, here's that word again, salvation, being saved. Sorry. Outside of the core is this realm of interpretation, those areas where people of goodwill acknowledge that there can be honest and heartfelt differences of interpretation of the scripture. And then finally, outside of that are areas of opinion, where people of goodwill uh, acknowledge that opinions can vary widely and that opinions have little bearing on salvation. They're just opinions. They're like belly buttons. Everybody's got them. <laughs> now, over the last 50 to 150 years, what's happened with so many denominations, of which there's like 37,000, in, in, in 1500, there was three. And now there's 37,000. What's happened in the last hundred years or so is that issues that used to be interpretive differences or differences of opinion migrated to the core. And these issues that used to be debatable have now become litmus tests for belonging and litmus tests to the truth. The doctrinal core has become so loaded with requirements for belonging and for salvation that many people have simply given up or been pushed back. The loaded doctrinal core includes things like where do you stand on abortion? Where do you stand on LGBTQ issues, on tithing, on gender exclusiveness, patriarchy, biblical inerrancy, <coughs> biblical inspiration, heaven and hell, cultural engagement or lack thereof. Can a Christian have a tattoo? <laughs> Alcohol, education, arts, dancing. We, our church believed that dancing was, dancing in church and worship was, was okay. Dancing elsewhere is bad, not okay. In fact, they, they precluded or precluded premarital sex because it might lead to dancing. <laughs> so, um, worship style, clothing, what version of the Bible? Are you KJV only or are you NRSV only? Uh, the, the evangelism method, political party affiliation. Immigration, these things got loaded into the environment or to the doctrinal core. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And all of a sudden, the doctrinal core becomes huge. Go to the next slide. And here's the problem we all have baggage. And now we have doctrinal core baggage that's added to us. <laughs> <laughs> and realize, realize I'm, I'm picking on the LDS here, but it could just as easily be the SBC or Missouri Synod or ELCA or Catholic. We've loaded things into the doctrinal core that don't need to be there. And as a result, the people of God are unreasonably burdened. Next slide. The problem with the overloaded uh, doctrinal core is that we all have baggage. And to that, we now add church baggage and requirements that people simply struggle with and cannot carry. And Jesus said, um, this process, they crush people with unbearable religious demands 
and never lift a finger to ease the burden. So the way some of us have felt, next slide, is like this. <laughs> We're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to stay in the harness and be engaged and do our part. And we got so much baggage, we can't even feel the burden. And the church has not helped. So, next slide. As a pushback against Protestant evangel evangelicalism and its overloaded doctrinal core, what many churches and denominations are doing is unloading the doctrinal core and putting it into the realm of interpretation or opinion. The fact that the ELCA is now in full communion with seven other different denominations it's because the ELCA looked and said, what's our doctrinal core? Can we work with other people who share our doctrinal core? We talked about this on Thursday night at the LGO Tap because we had an ELCA pastor who, who had pastored in a, a Anglican church or a Episcopalian. And we had, oh boy, we had quite a conversation about traditions versus tradition and how could any of us give up what we hold so dear in the Lutheran liturgy in order to go to another church. So what's happened, see, um, when, when uh, how many of you read uh, Love Wins by Rob Bell? Two, three, excellent. Okay. Rob Bell was an evangelical pastor who started to question hell and universal salvation. Started to embrace universal salvation oh, and, and do away with the concept of hell. And he got drummed out of evangelicalism. I thought it was one of the best books I read, I read in a long time. So while many of us uh, felt that unloading is a significant release and, and, and freedom, for other people, they just said, ah, he's going to hell. The hell he doesn't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, when the ELCA unloaded the doctoral core with regard to LGBTQ issues, there was significant pushback in the ELCA um, and from many in the church who left and quit giving. They're still Lutheran, but by God, they're not going to give to that church anymore. <laughs> so this process of unloading the doctoral core occurs when a group of believers, um, a group will come together and decide in community what they will stand for and what they won't. And what happens uh, when you get in, in essence, a new denomination or movement. And what Tickle and many others have just, uh, identified in the last 20 years is a series of groups that have just done this, unloaded the doctrinal core. When it, uh, when it happens in a church, it's called unloading the doctrinal core. When it happens to an individual, it's called faith shift or deconstruction. And next week, we'll talk about those things. Uh, but next slide. So um, these are some references that I found useful and helpful. Um, they're here. You can take a look at them. Um, the End of White Christian America. It's fabulous. Uh, the Fall of the Evangelical Nation. Christine Wicker rocked my world. Um, Next Christians by Gabe Lyons. He was, Gabe Lyons is the, uh, I mean, was the number one guy at Gallup. And they've done all kinds of surveys trying to figure out why are people leaving the church? And he did that. Uh, Emergence Christianity is Phil's Tickle, the follow on to Faith Emergence. The Church on the Other Side by Brian McLaren. A New Kind of Christianity by Brian McLaren. The Greek Spiritual Migration by Brian McLaren. Um, Carol Dana turned me on to this one. Christ actually. Uh, Reimagining Faith in the Modern Age. And then this one I just got, Being a Christian in the 21st Century. Interesting stuff. So we're going to pick this up next week. So I want you to think about these three questions for the next week. What do you think the church on the other side is going to look like? We did this exercise with Theology on Tap uh, in January, February, it was a long time ago. And we had a 
really interesting ideas come out because I ask people just identify two things, two things that you think the future church will be doing differently than the church today. The second thing is what might unloading the doctrinal core look like for the ELCA? And this is tough because like most denominations, you're steeped in your traditions. Some of those traditions have migrated, whether intentionally or unintentionally, to the doctrinal core. Well, what would the ELCA church look like if we abandoned some of those closely held traditions, put them out of the core, what remains in the core? And then for you individually, what might unloading the doctrinal core look like for you? I'll give you an example. For me, LGBTQ issues. I reached a point with a ton of research and reading where I realized my church is wrong about this subject. I don't think people are choosing this. I think it happens. It's genetic. It's wiring. It's for whatever reason. I don't want to do it. My problem is women. I don't have a problem with women. <laughs> <laughs> and Within two years after me arriving at that decision, my daughter, the oldest daughter, came out oh. as a lesbian. And she was so frightened to tell me. And God had prepared me because I had no clue. <laughs> and when she came out, my first response was, Oh, I'm so happy for you. I hope you find someone to love. And I'm probably closer with her now than I've ever been. I had to unload my doctrinal core. The choice was following my church or being a lover, loving representation of the father to my daughter. I had to unload my doctrinal core. So think about these three questions. What do you think the future of the church is going to look like in 30 years? What might unloading the doctrinal core look like for the ELCA? And what might it look like for you, even if the ELCA doesn't change? So might the doctrinal core also be cultural? Yes. In the sense that there are things that are part of core Lutheranism, for example, that aren't necessarily doctrine, mm -hmm. but much more culture. Yeah, yeah. from your, your deep roots in Germany and Scandinavia, um, I, I have never met a more unexpressive group of people. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dan, Dan is, uh, sorry. I mean, Methodists are like flaming. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, some of that's cultural. It's just how. Yeah, yeah. Or traditions with a little t. Versus tradition with a big T. Well, then that's half point. If those are the things that used to be interpretation or things right. that are not part of the right. because they're so different. Right. But they are cultural and they shouldn't be. So there are, yeah, yeah, yeah. What Kathy said is they are cultural and shouldn't be uh, in the core. Okay, so there you go. Next week, when we, I'll ask you these questions and I'll ask everybody to share right in front of your church mates. Yes. I just am again, curious. I thought this was a very wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, but would the same context apply if you were looking at um, Islam religion, yeah. where 500 yeah. years they have? Uh, well, I don't know about that, but I know that they're going through the same kinds of struggles now where the fundamentalist branch of Islam is are terrorists and they're killing people and beheading people and the, the regular is Islam Muslims are like that's not us yeah that's not who we are we don't do that it would be curious to you know do the same kind of research yeah that religion I'm I'm not uh, young enough to do that <laughs> so I guess that's it that's us we're done yeah. thank you all <laughs>